Good. Right. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to my session on um, UI testing with Selenium and Node. Um, I'm Keir Bowden, CTO of BrightGen. Um, we're sponsoring the Candy Floss machine, which is due to arrive around four, apparently. Not at the nine o'clock that I was told, so that rather threw my schedule out today. Um, and you'll probably find me there from four o'clock onwards, to be honest, because I love Candy Floss. Um, so please come and talk to us. We're also hiring. Um, I'm better known in the community as Bob Buzzard, um, and I'm a Salesforce MVP, which means I do a lot of these kind of uh, presentations in the community. Been working with Salesforce for just over 10 years now, and it, it seems like yesterday that I started. Um, so first off, I want to talk about Selenium. What does Selenium do? So this is pretty much word for word from the Selenium website. Selenium automates browsers, and that's all it does. Um, there are lots of use cases for Selenium. There are lots of ways that people are using Selenium, but that's up to them. What they do with that browser, what you do with the browser automation is none of Selenium's concern. They just allow you to automate browsers. Now that said, the primary use case is user interface testing because it allows you to run your application in a browser as a real application. Um, this, by turns, is both awesome and it really sucks. So. It, it sucks because it's typically really brittle. Um, as soon as anything changes in the UI, then often your Selenium scripts will break because the thing they're looking for isn't there anymore. It's called something else. Um, and they're usually non-comprehensive because they take so much nurturing, it's really difficult to get a broad and deep coverage. Um, they're awesome because there is nothing that tests the system like actually firing up in a browser you know, in a real application and doing stuff with it. So, the, um, the thing to look for when you're considering this kind of user interface testing is to try and automate things where you can automate it more cheaply than someone running those tests over and over again. Um, if it's something which you need to test a couple of times a year and it takes someone 15 minutes to do it, um, you're probably going to spend more time trying to keep that green in Selenium than, than the effort someone's putting in. So it's trying to make sure you get the best bang for buck, the best return on investment. But it is typically difficult to keep all the Selenium tests green. It's just a fact of life. So, Selenium does all this through the web driver. So, the idea of the web driver, it's a remote control interface to any particular browser. And what it allows you to do is to do things with that browser. You can reach into, the, into it, you can look at the internals, you can set cookies, you can inspect the cookies that have been set, you can reach into the DOM, you can find elements in the DOM and you can interact with them. So it's really powerful in that respect. Um, it's platform and language neutral, so it works on you know, web drivers for most major browsers, and often there's multiple web drivers, so it might be an official one and a community one. Um, and it's language neutral, there's loads of language bindings. Um, I've used Java and JavaScript, there's also Python, C Sharp, um, loads and loads of different ones. Um, so basically, if you want to test it, you should be able to do that with um, with Selenium, um, even some of the more niche browsers it covers as well. So it's possible if you've got some kind of weird embedded type system, you might not um, have that available. But most of the time, I've found what you want to do, you'll be able to do with it. Um, it's also test framework agnostic, and that's because it's agnostic to what you're doing with it. It's just automating the browser, as I mentioned in the previous slide. So if you're going to embed it into a test framework, you can pick, pick whichever one you like. As long as it can run the code that is executing things via the web driver, it doesn't matter what you use. I um, intentionally haven't merged any of my code in today in with a test framework. I'm just showing some node code that allows you to do things within the browser because I didn't want to get into then explaining how things like Mocha and Jasmine, etc., work. Um, and then you get a bit into religious wars as well as whether Mocha is better than Jasmine and whether Jest is the new kid on the block and all that kind of stuff. Um, and it also can run on a, can drive a local or remote browser. So all the stuff I'm going to do today is on my laptop, but you can have it driving on another machine. Sometimes that's useful in a continuous integration type environment where the machine that you're running on doesn't actually, you know, it, it, it may be a headless thing, it may not be able to fire up the browser. Um, so I use, this is, this is the, um, the module that I use in order to do development um, in Node against Selenium, which is the Selenium web driver. It's a Node module, so it's on NPM, you can do NPM install, and it all comes down fine. It's the official Selenium implementation, which is almost certainly why I use that one, because I would have just gone and looked on their website, found that, installed it, got some stuff working, and it's very unlikely I'd then go and look and see if I can do it with something else, having put that effort in. Um, slight downside. Uh, current version is 4.0.0 hyphen alpha hyphen one, and that was updated about a year ago. So it's not getting an awful lot of love. However, I haven't actually found there's anything broken or wrong with it. So I guess your mileage may vary, um, but I've, I've found no issue with the fact that it's not being particularly worked on at the moment because it, it just works with what I want to do. Um, as I said, there are other implementations. That's the official Selenium one. Um, webdriver.io um, seems to be quite popular at the moment. 
I'm always slightly nervous of using the community ones because they tend to rise and fall a bit like JavaScript frameworks. So investing in something which could be gone in a, in a year or two always makes me a little bit nervous. Um, but that's the route that I've gone and that's the route that my examples use on the GitHub repo. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm do a simple demo to begin with, which is logging into Salesforce. If I remember the right command. So this goes quite quickly, so keep an eye on it. But basically it fires up Salesforce, when everything's finished loading, it enters my user ID and password, and then it takes, and then it goes into Salesforce, and I'm logged in, and eventually Einstein gets there. Um, so that's a, it's a really simple demo. There's only a few lines of code, which I'll show in a minute. Allows me to log into Salesforce. So you know, big work. That doesn't really seem like it does an awful lot, but actually, what that allows me to do is something as simple as a health check. So I could run that 6 a.m. every morning. I could run that, and then capture the output, and I know when I get up if my user's gonna be able to log in or not on the particular system. Now, it might be, you know, Salesforce, there's nothing I can do about it, but it means I can be prepared to say, hey, it's not me, it's Salesforce, there's nothing I can do about it. I can be slightly ahead of the game um, without really putting an awful lot of effort in, as I say, a few lines of code on that. <coughs> so, if I just, one, one word of warning if you are thinking of doing that. Um, and setting up something which automatically logs in. Um, bear in mind things like password policies, when your password expires, how many attempts you might have. Because if you've got, say, three attempts and it's Easter, the next time you look, it might be the Tuesday after Easter, and you might be locked out of your production system. Who knows? Apparently these things happen. Couldn't possibly comment. Um, so this is the code that I ran. Um, fairly straightforward. Basically, get to the login.salesforce.com, waits until the username appears for a number of seconds, number of milliseconds, finds the element called username and sends some keys to it, finds the element named password and sends some keys to it, and finally finds the login button and clicks that. So not an awful lot of code, you know, instantiating the drivers, maybe another two or three lines, but sort of in 10 lines. However, what this really demonstrates, I think, is the brittle nature of it. Salesforce push an update, that's no longer called username. Oh, I failed, sorry. Uh, they push an update, it's no longer called password. Yeah, it's failed again, it's errored. Or they move the login button, they call it something else, sign in, uh, it's gone again. Um, Salesforce is running a bit slow, it takes more than 10,000 milliseconds, 10 seconds, oh no, it's errored again. So that's the brittle nature. Um, they're easy enough to fix because things just change, but as I say, keeping them green consistently is really hard work. And you know, in my view, it's probably not worth worrying too much about. It's more of a, a bit of a comfort blanket than a, a gate to uh, say it must pass all this before your code can possibly go live. <laughs> Yeah, I'm waiting for the page to load. So the question was, the reason I'm waiting 10,000 milliseconds is I'm waiting for the page to load. Exactly, so I hit login.salesforce.com and I know that that sometimes takes a little while to draw me the login page. It's got to pull in normally an advert, sometimes showing some idiot like me from the community. Um, so it won't wait for 10,000 milliseconds, it'll wait up to 10,000 milliseconds. So if something appears before then, so if you find that you're consistently timing out, then you just keep upping that to 60, 120, however many seconds that you need. Uh, so the question was again, um, the, so the driver can't find out the page is loaded. No, the only, the only way the driver can, so basically I have to ask the driver to go and check stuff. I can't have a, I can't kind of register a callback saying when this happens, execute my code in that way. It's all up to me to, to push the browser to do things. Um, so looking at the title of this, so Selenium has a promise manager, which means that my code looks synchronous. Keyword there, looks synchronous. So what it looks like is I do a get, and then once that's done, I do a driver.wait until I see this thing up to 10 seconds. When that's done, I find the element and send some keys to it. When that's done, send more keys. When that's done, I click the login button. Um, it is not synchronous, as this piece of code that I'm about to run will demonstrate. So what I'm doing here, doing driver.find elements. This is purely cold from the uh, previous piece of code. I said driver find element by name username. So that's going to go to the username box on the page. But then I'm saying get the attribute named value, which is the text that I've put into it. So I've already put in my username. So what I'm doing now is I'm checking that's been taken. Um, and when I first started using the Chrome driver, it would sometimes miss keys under certain circumstances. So I did need to see if it got in there. Otherwise, I'd try again a few times. So then I say, depending on what the text is, I'll either find it as I expected or I'll log the fact that there is an error. So all looks good. If I run this. I'm going to move this over to the right because I want you to keep an eye on this. Can you see it, right? If I zoom in a bit more. Um, and now I'm going to run this. Keep an eye on the right-hand side. 
So did we notice that? So I'll run it again. So we can see there is that's errored way before it's done anything in terms of loading the page and putting my details in. If I just quit that. Um, you don't have to quit this manually all the time. However, if you don't, um, sorry, if you do quit it programmatically, it'll basically flash up and then it will be gone in some situations, which doesn't make for a great demo. So we want to look at what's in there. But anyway, so what happens here is that it immediately says error expected to find the keys I sent, whereas you know I didn't even seem to have a page to put them in. And that is because I, it's, it's returning a promise. It's not returning the result. So the promise manager, what that does is as I do things like driver.find element by name, that adds it to a queue. And then it carries on and finds the next thing, which says driver do something else, adds it to a queue. So they all happen in the order that I wanted them to happen, but they don't happen as I ask for them to happen. So what I have to do, because it's returning a promise, and a promise is basically some of the returns that says at some point this function will complete, and when it does, um, I will either invoke a, a function you provide to say it's completed, here's the result, or a function you provide that says there's been an error and you need to take some correct, corrective action. So I need to resolve the promise, and that's where the dot then comes in. So basically, find element by name, username, get the attribute of value. Once that's complete, execute the function that takes a parameter of the text. And at this point, I can compare the text with what I put in, and then I hopefully will find the information that I expected to find. So if I do async, OK. So if you watch the right-hand side again, what you see this time is nothing, nothing, nothing. Then I've populated my information, and then it's gone and pulled it back. So the promise manager is really cool in terms of allowing you not to worry too much about the asynchronous nature of JavaScript. However, it kind of does lead you down a path where what you think is happening isn't really what is happening. It's also it's a very divisive thing in the, um, the Selenium node world, I would say. Lots of people are very angry about it. No one seems to know why this was done. Um, the thinking is that it was to make it seem more familiar to Python and Java developers that weren't used to working in asynchronous fashion. And obviously, all the JavaScript developers that are hate it with a passion and are very angry about the whole thing, which is maybe why you've got things like webdriver.io, which is their own interpretation of it. OK, so some key functions that I've used in, uh, in this. <coughs> uh, key functions on the web driver. I might wander over this way, actually. Try not to trip over. So webdriver.get, um, that's what I use to open a URL. So in the beginning of my um, login, I opened login.salesforce.com. That's all it does. Opens a URL in a remote control browser, um, and it, that's queued. So if I want to know, if I want to do something else after something else has happened, I have to give it. I have to go and look for some conditions, which is where I get into the webdriver.wait. So basically, that just says wait for something to happen. That until can have lots of different things. The one I use the most is until an element is shown or hidden. Um, give it a condition and up to time out milliseconds. Um, as I say, it won't wait until for that many milliseconds unless something goes wrong. If it comes within a millisecond, it'll immediately progress. Um, this is what I use most of the time, I would say. Web driver, find element, by some mechanism. So this allows me to locate an element in the DOM, an element on the page effectively. And there's various ways I can do that. By name, quite fragile. By class name, really, really quite misleading because if it's got two classes, then your class name needs to be two classes as well. And if it gets things added and removed dynamically, that doesn't work at all. Um, ID, anyone that's used Selenium with Visual Force will be familiar with the fact that the IDs change when you promote from a sandbox to production. Uh, more brittleness. Um, CSS, you can look at various CSS attributes. Or XPath, which I've bolded because I think that's the way to do things, um, which I'll come to a bit later. So those are the kind of web driver things that allow me to wander around the browser page. Once I've got an element, there's then things that I want to do with that. So again, this was shown in the first piece of code. I can do send keys with a key sequence. I can effectively, that's the same as a user typing a key sequence in a DOM element. And it uh, allows me to have meta keys, so control, shift, things like that. Um, there's also web element dot click. And that's, those are really the two things you want to do most of the time, is, is enter, some, enter something and click something, and navigate around via URLs. So click just clicks on the DOM element like a button, but anything that's clickable, it can clip on, click on. So then we come back to find element. So we saw find element earlier on, find element by mechanism. That was on the driver. So that basically says anything from HTML below really find the element. We do web element find element. That says I've got something. Maybe I've got a div with a particular ID. Find element says find a descendant, find inside this div. I don't want, to, I don't want anything else outside of that. So I used to use that an awful lot before I got to grips with XPath. 
because I would do a lot of wandering around the dom and finding things and then trying to find their children or their parents and a lot of, a lot of boilerplate code. So that was, we are shown a simple demo, so now I'm going to show a more complicated demo, um, probably more than once because it does a few things and the one thing about Selenium is that it does do them pretty quickly. You realise how much as a human you are slowing down the actual testing of the UI. So this is logging in. Having logged in, it's going to go to the opportunity list page and it's going to click the new button, fill in a load of information, save it and check that we're on the opportunity view page. So that's it. That's my unit test to show or my UI test to show that I can actually create an opportunity. Um, now that was really quick, I know. So I videoed it. So sadly, Jody's not here, but the point I was going to make is that I showed it first, I showed it working, then I showed you a video. So it's not like I pretended that I'd done this live and I hadn't done this live. So this will run at half speed, which will probably be a bit too quick, but then I'll just go back over a couple of bits and pieces. But you can see a little bit more about what's happening, hopefully, in terms of the way the page builds up and I have to wait for things to happen. So I had to wait for that new button to come in, then I could click it. Then I'm filling in these, and as I'm filling it in, the page is re-rendering, and I'm locating those elements and doing bits and pieces. So again, still pretty quick, but if I go back... So the interesting bits here were things like filling in the account name. So I type in Gene Point. As I'm typing, it's offering me a new account. Um, then as I type a bit more and I wait for a, a moment or two, it offers me search, which isn't what I want. But then eventually it reacts enough to offer me Gene Point. That's the thing I've been waiting for so I can click on that. Um, other interesting thing is the stage. Stage might, God, it's really hard to get to it. Stage might look like a select. It's not. It's something you click on and then it changes a whole bunch of stuff in the DOM with a load of anchor tags in it. And that is incredibly hard to look at the DOM, inspect the DOM, and figure out what it actually looks like to the point that I had to put a JavaScript um, break in there. I had to, had to basically stop anything happening as soon as that changed, and then I can actually see what it looked like. So that's the kind of thing that's going on, and then it clicks save, and then the, I then wait until I get back on the view page. And again, you can see the kind of things that go on in Lightning. You can see how this page gradually builds up. So if you're doing something like Selenium, you're going to spend a lot of time waiting for stuff. Right, I'll quit out of that. Check how we're doing for time. Okay. Um, okay, so that's my demo of creating an opportunity. So it uh, wouldn't, wouldn't be a talk at London's calling 2019 if I didn't mention web components. Web components introduce a challenge for, this is standard web components we're talking about here for Selenium. So what happens is you've got this concept of a shadow root. You can see that in Chrome, but effectively better button is a shadow host, and inside that you've got shadow DOM. Um, Webdriver.find element can't see into that because it's shadow DOM, it's not its to look in. Um, so if you try and find a span with the idea of wrapper, you won't find that. Um, so what you have to do, you can get to the shadow host of better button in this case off of a Google thing. And then based on that, you can do the shadow host, is driver find my element, um, which is a better button, and then execute some script to say, get the, sh the zeroth element uh, of the um, of the shadow host called um, sorry the zeroth child of shadow host get its shadow root and at that point in time I've got a web element and I can go back into normal stuff I didn't figure any of this out by the way there's a medium post link to the bottom somebody else did all this hard work and I'd imagine that Selenium will come up to um, uh, will get the hang of this fairly shortly as well it won't need this kind of um, boilerplate code added to the S of it so that's standard web components the web standard, Lightning Web Components. So what do we need to do in Lightning Web Components in order to get into the Shadow DOM? Nothing, because Lightning Web Components do not use the native Shadow DOM. They use something called a synthetic Shadow DOM. Um, some people might find this typical sales source, couldn't quite use what was there, had to have their own version, slightly different. Uh, it's done with the best, um, best intentions because it allows browsers that don't support Shadow DOM, because it's still relatively new. It allows Lightning Web Components to run into that. It's a synthetic DOM. When you're writing web components and your code is running, it looks to an all intents and purposes like the real shadow DOM. It's got all the, um, the features that you would expect. However, when it's rendered to the browser, it's just regular or light DOM in web components um, talk. Um, they have said that they will switch to using the native DOM as soon as they can, as soon as it's appropriate. When that happens, if you've got any tests that are expecting it not to be using the Shadow DOM, they're all going to break again. So we go back to brittle. Something's changed under the hood. You've got to write a whole node more code. So again, should you be doing it is always a good question. 
So I'm just going to do a simple demo of a lightning of a web component, um, just to prove that I'm not lying. Really, it won't. Um, I won't do it in slow motion or anything. But it basically just opens up a page which has a contact search, looks for a contact with the name of Sean, and checks that the body of the web component has updated to show a match of Sean. So again, logging into Salesforce as always, going to my Flexi page, my Lightning web component is in there. This is all in the Git repo as well, so you can see that. Um, and that's now found the expected result. So you can see here, Sean, search Sean Forbes at edge.com. Awesome. So. Some takeaways. First off, baby steps. Um, add one item at a time. Can't say this strongly enough. If you try and add a load of stuff, um, typically speaking, things don't work and you can't really figure out why. So add one item, test after each item. Feels really slow and really clunky, but it does work well and it gets you where you want to go. Keep your scenario short. You want loads of little scenarios rather than one big scenario. Um, and use modules. Uh, if you don't use modules, you don't reuse code within JavaScript, you're going to end up with about a million methods called log into Salesforce, which is what I had. I had five, and now I've got one, and it's much nicer and I'm much happier, especially when I wanted to redact my password before pushing it to GitHub. Um, key takeaways two, this is probably the bigger one, use XPath. Use XPath to identify elements on the page. So if you haven't used XPath before, it can be a little bit daunting. It feels a bit like a regular expression. But actually, if you break it down, it's not that hard, which we're going to do now. So forward slash forward slash label says from the top, there's nothing before it, so it's the top element. It's from HTML, anything, any descendant node, there's a label. Awesome. So that's a lot. So then we start to narrow it down. We're saying any label, forward slash span, that has a direct descendant, single slash, that is a span. There's probably going to be a few of those. However, we know more about the span. So we basically put a kind of selector bracket in there. And we're saying whose text, the text in the span, contains a string literal. And that's my string literal, the opportunity name. Um, anyone that's been around an operating system should be familiar with dot dot. Dot dot basically means parent directory. Same thing here. So basically forward slash dot dot is parent, dot dot is grandparent. So whose grandparent node contains an input. So what we've got there is basically any label with a direct descendant of span that contains the text opportunity name and then go up to its grandparent and find, some, find an input. And it'll only be an element that matches that whole set of rules that gets returned to XPath. So that's what we're doing here. Basically, we've got a label. It's got a child of span that contains opportunity name. We go up to its grandparent, which is a div, and we drop down and we get that input. And what that equates to is the opportunity name. That's, that's the thing that I want to get to. And that's because it's not got IDs and things like that, and it's not got great class names and things, um, it's, it's, that's a way of doing it. Other beauty of XPath is you can use it in the browser. So if you go into Chrome Tools and you type that in, it'll show me there's one of one. Hey, it's valid. There's only one of them. That's exactly what I want. I've found the element I'm looking for. Even nicer, it'll also show you this is what it actually is. So I can see, yeah, OK, that is the thing that I'm expecting. And it'll show me that highlighted in the elements. So XPath is really, really powerful. If you don't use XPath, what you end up with is loads of find element by name and then find the descendant and then get its parent. And you end up with like 15 lines of code, which you can do in one slightly more complicated expression once you get over the, the fear that you've suddenly somehow been dragged into regular expression land and you're never going to get out again. Um, so that was it in terms of the whistle stop tour of Selenium um, and the beauty of XPath. Um, hopefully some useful links there, Selenium headquarters, the node package, the repo that's got my code in it. So it's got those demos and it's got the lightning web components and instructions. Um, and there's a medium post around Selenium and the shadow DOM of someone explaining um, how that all works. Are there any questions? Yeah, so you do that using modules, so that you could just use JavaScript will import a module. So I import the login. I've got a single piece of login code, and they can all import that login. So if it was a matter of navigating to opportunity again, that would be a library function they could all um, live on. Is there a utility that would auto-create the um, XPath code for you? Um, so the question was, is there a utility that will auto-create the XPath? Browsers will, but they'll almost always do it by just figuring out the the hierarchy of elements. So you'll get this really long, and it's very tied to the structure. So I tend not to use that. I tend to find something which I think is more unique than that and less prone to um, restructuring. I say, if you look at a lot, if you look at that, so um, uh, this isn't a question, but if there are other ways of doing this than Selenium. Selenium, you're writing it all yourself. If you look at some of these cloud tools, 
Um, some of them will like figure out multiple ways of identifying that element. So if one breaks, it's got a fallback and they'll self-heal. So they'll, okay, the, the ID doesn't work anymore. Is there a different ID now I've found it? Can I update my information, et cetera? Obviously you pay for that kind of functionality. Um, and that may be worth doing. I and mean, I think for simple stuff, Selenium's like really easy, really straightforward. As soon as you do a bit more complex, then maybe it's time to think about paying someone else to suffer that pain. You did have a question? Um, so the question was, how does this fit in with browser stack? Um, I honestly don't know. We do have a browser stack subscription, um, but I don't know if that actually makes it accessible to me or not. Again, Rich might know. Right, so that is reachable from Selenium as a, as a remote server. Yeah, so that should all be cool as well. Yeah, which is obviously what you want to do because just proving it works on Chrome probably isn't satisfying everybody's use case. Uh, no, I haven't. I, I, I'm really excited about it because it allows us to do local tests. We don't have to deploy it, which we had to do with Lightning components. So you've, the browser should be removed out of it, and you should genuinely be unit testing your Lightning logic, your logic of your Lightning web components. I haven't actually used it, but I have spoken to a couple of people I know are very good at JavaScript unit testing and hated the way that you had to do it in Lightning components. And they speak very sorry, Aura components, and they speak very highly of it. So I have high hopes. It also, what Jest allows you to do, it has code coverage which is really important and was pretty much impossible to do with Aura. So you'd be able to see that you're actually exercising all of your business logic. Cool. Thank you very much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Capato separates user stories into individual feature branches in your code repository. This makes it easy to deploy code into multiple environments without having to worry about other developers' changes being introduced accidentally. Capato also automates the process of doing a pull request, making it easy to compare code from one environment to the other. Earlier, with chain sets, uh, adding metadata components used to take time. But with Copado, it has become easy and quick because it provides ability to search, filter by type, last modified by, create a date, etc. Also, it has ability to integrate with Jira, Git, Bitbucket, making it powerful and providing traceability for our changes. As a release manager at MassMutual, the great benefits I see are it helps us to bundle multiple user stories across the team and deploy in one go, which saves a lot of release time. But in chain sets, we have to deploy user stories individually. With chain sets, developer can skip and environments while deployment. But with Copado, we have a set deployment flow between the environment. Copado comes with a great reports and dashboard, which helps us to track an org level metadata changes. When I joined MassMutual approximately a year ago, we had a team size of around 50. Now, over the last year, we've increased probably about twofold, and we've gone over 100 people for this team. Bringing in Copado was one of our best decisions. Not only was it a scalable solution with delivery with high confidence, but it also introduces and integrates the QA piece, establishing a CI CD pipeline that every company really wants in today's day. They have given us professional support, they have given us innovative solutions, they have really worked with us hand in hand closely to make it a success story for us. What some people may not realize is that MassMutual has been on Salesforce now for many years. As we leaned into our digital transformation, this presented both a challenge and an automation. This presented both a challenge and an opportunity in terms of maturing our release management practice. I'm actually very pleased with both the features and the partnership Capato has offered. We've achieved a number of short-term wins, and I'm now more confident about our future ability to scale uh, our DevOps practices here at MassMutual.